It's time to talk charging plugs. You may have already heard it, but it seems like the whole world is moving towards the Tesla charging plug, now known as NACS or the North American Charging Standard. Some people are also calling it NAX. And uh, here's why I should say that I'm being hyperbolic, of course, because really just North America is moving to this baby right here. Uh, we'll talk about why that is and why you are not going to be seeing this in Europe or around the world anytime soon, why it doesn't make sense in some of these other places around the world. But let's just dive into these two charging standards and bear in mind, I'll also be talking about CCS, not just this J1772 connector without the little dongles at the bottom. Uh, first off, how did we get here? This is probably an important thing to consider. Uh, and this is where I will say my personal feelings on this matter, because a lot of folks have asked, you know, Alex, what do you think about this? My personal thoughts are sweet baby Jesus, just everybody get in the room and pick one plug. I don't care what it is. It could be a paddle from the 1990s. I don't care. Pick one and let's just stick with it. Um, there has been a lot of talk about, oh my goodness, we need to move to the NAX connector because it's just so much slimmer and so much sexier because, you know, car designs, you just need this slim, sexy thing to be a modern vehicle. I don't buy it. You know what? Cars have had big doors for gasoline and diesel for decades and decades and decades, solid 70 years at this point. It's not a design challenge to design a hole for this and a hole for that. That makes absolutely no, no sense. Uh, the other issue that I have is, oh, well, you know, we need the reliability of the Tesla network. And that's the other reason we need this connector. That's kind of stupid as well, because once Tesla opens to other vehicles, I suspect this is going to be a slightly different experience. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. And there's some other videos you can check out on the channel as well. But again, let's talk about how we got here in the first place. If you roll the way back machine to some of the first electric vehicles that were sold or leased in California, you notice they used an inductive charging paddle. And that's because, I don't know, California decided that inductive charging paddles were the way to go. Then a little bit later, California decided that maybe we need conductive charging plugs where we actually have pins that match, sort of like you plug in a lamp at home. But of course, you know, we couldn't just use a regular plug. We had to use some fancy electric car plug. So this puppy was designed. Well, let me rewind, actually, I guess a little bit more. There was originally a square version, which I could not find any pictures of. That was the J772-2001 standard. This is the 2009 standard. The dates are important for why things turned out the way they did, but let's talk about this connector first. It was designed for an operational life cycle of about 10,000 insertion removal cycles. It was designed for relatively high current AC single phase charging. So 240 volts AC, and that's why we have three pins on the inside, three big pins, and that's ground, line one, and line two. We then have a pin for data communication and then a pin so that way it knows that it's plugged in. You plug the connector into the vehicle, it communicates with the EVSE, the electric vehicle supply equipment, and that tells the vehicle what kind of power is available, and then it will pull whatever kind of power it wants to up to that limit. The features of this connector are interesting because at the time it was designed to be a forward looking sort of connector, but just AC charging. Uh, it was designed so that with the latching mechanisms on the outside, this is what some people complain about, it's a mechanical latch mechanism, and it was designed to be serviceable. So you'll notice that we have screws here on the side. You can actually take this connector apart and you can service its internals. Now, not all J1772 connectors are serviceable. I actually have a failed one here uh, that I had a problem with earlier, and this one is unfortunately not serviceable. Uh, it's actually sealed, so it's designed to be slightly slimmer than the other. It also has a little light on top, which is kind of cool, and the release button is down there instead of on top, just minor changes. Now, the important thing to remember is that at the time that this plug came out, they weren't doing DC fast charging except for Tesla. And Tesla wasn't doing DC fast charging until the Model S. And that's part of why when we take a look at a Tesla connector, the connectors are somewhat larger. Well, actually quite a bit larger over here because these do double duty. They're AC conductors and DC conductors. The vehicle will automatically open and close a relay and switch over uh, to wherever the power needs to go on board. And that's perhaps the engineering elegance and simplicity with this Tesla connector. Now, some folks out there have just said, oh, well, you know, this thing is so stupid. Why did it end up being the way that it ended up? Well, Actual size wise, these connectors really aren't that far off when you actually take a look at the mating mechanism on the vehicle. 
There is a little bit of added bulk because the lock mechanism is on the connector here. And on the Tesla side, the latch mechanism is part of the receptacle on the vehicle. So if your latch mechanism fails, the vehicle is what actually has to get serviced there. And that's why we have a button here. It's actually an electrical contactor. It communicates to the vehicle. The vehicle unlatches uh, the latch electrically. So it's not a mechanical, uh, you know, user mechanical latch. It's actually an electrically actuated one. So there are certainly pros and cons. Uh, another one, while I'm thinking about it here, is the NACS connectors are not serviceable in the same way J1772 connectors seem to be. Uh, at least I have never seen one. These are all completely sealed. This is a Tesla one. Uh, these are all completely sealed. So the repair options are you buy a new one. It seems like that's the repair option. Whereas with these guys, you could get the components. And if you have a lot of them, you could actually recrimp new terminals on there and put them right back into service. Uh, but let's go back to that DC fast charging thing. And the reason CCS has those two bulky connectors at the bottom. When this connector was envisioned, DC fast charging wasn't really a thing. The batteries were relatively small. They didn't really think too much about that. There was the CHAdeMO standard in Japan that Nissan, of course, and Mitsubishi decided to use in North America, also Kia for a hot second. And they thought, well, you know, maybe DC fast charging, maybe it's okay that it's a completely separate connector. Um, obviously, that was a little bit silly. They thought maybe we should just put it on the same bundle. But there could be EVs that didn't need DC fast charging, EVs that did. So they simply added on to it because this connector had already been around for quite some time. And again, on the Tesla side of things, this connector was envisioned with DC fast charging right from the beginning. Now, on an engineering level, this way slimmer, way sexier. If I were going to design a connector for a new EV, I would hope that this is the direction that I would go because it's just really easy to deal with. Now, on another front, a lot of folks have been talking about cable sizes and why the cable slim and sexier. Uh, let's just talk through some of the things that make no sense here. Slim, sexy cable, not really a deal because this is just rated for more power and that's why it's thicker than this one. Also, supercharger connectors versus the CCS connectors you find at Electrify America. There's no reason you couldn't use the same core cable sizes as long as the cables are the right length and they're liquid cooled appropriately on either side, etc. That's not rational either. They could both have the same size cables if they really wanted to. And once we find uh, Tesla V4 supercharger stations that have 20 or 25 foot cables, it's entirely probable that those cables or those cables will need to be a little bit thicker uh, in order to compensate for that added cable length and the extra heat that's generated by the resistance in the cables, etc. At this point, some of you are probably shouting, but NACS is going to make charging more reliable. Well, perhaps, but it doesn't really have a great deal to do with the plug itself. We actually don't really have any good durability studies between these two connectors or even CCS to the supercharging connector, but I'm sure that will come at some point. Will the NACS connector make charging more reliable? That's a question I've been asked quite a lot lately, and the honest answer is we just don't know. Part of the reason that NACS or Tesla charging is reliable is because Tesla writes the software on both sides. They make the vehicle, they make the chargers, they make the superchargers, and they write all the software for all of them, and they validate all of that software with one another. If Tesla gets to validate General Motors software and Ford software before it gets put into Ford and General Motors vehicles, and Tesla validates them all physically as well with their supercharger stations and their destination chargers, et cetera, then yeah, you're probably gonna have a very Tesla-like charging experience. Here's the thing though, Ford and GM could have done that with Electrify America, with vendors of J1772 plugs, with EVgo, but they didn't. So do we really think that this decision to go to Tesla's connector is also accompanied with a new dedication to validating software, et cetera? If you reach out to Electrify America, for instance, you talk to some of their folks, they said that Ford did not provide them with any examples of the Mach-E before it went into production. And they claim that's part of why the Mach-E had some charging issues when it went into production. So are those problems going to follow everybody over to Tesla superchargers? I would argue yes, 
unless manufacturers change their tune. And you can see a little bit of that now if you are near a Tesla Magic dock, as I happen to be. There's one in Scotts Valley, California. You can roll up in your non-Tesla EV, plug your non-Tesla EV in with the adapter, and ostensibly DC fast charge. But it's not always the smoothest process. And that's probably because the BZ4X, the EV6, the Genesis GV60, the Ford Lightning, etc., that we have charged there have not been validated with Tesla. Now, I know that the Hyundai Kia Group has been talking to Tesla about charging speed issues at supercharger stations with their vehicles, but that's a story for a little bit later in this video. Bottom line when it comes to reliability is that this connector alone is not really going to change a great deal. Supercharger stations are probably still going to be better maintained than EA stations or EVgo stations. It seems like Tesla is really, really good about knowing that there's a problem with a supercharger station and replacing the cords or fixing whatever might be wrong. On the other side of things, when Electrify America adopts this connector, as they have already said that they will, and they start putting this at all of their stations so Tesla owners can charge, etc., then Tesla owners are going to get an Electrify America charging experience, and everybody else will probably get an experience somewhere between the worlds depending on how closely those manufacturers work with Tesla on the testing and validation of software. Yes, NACS is a standard. Yes, there is going to be an SAE standard associated with it, but there's already an SAE standard for CCS, and we all know how that's gone. A lot of folks have been asking if the dominoes falling in the U.S. mean that dominoes are going to start falling elsewhere around the world. The answer is probably not. China has their rules about what connector vehicles should have there, and they're pretty ironclad. Everybody follows those rules, including Tesla. In Japan, Chatamo is by far the de facto standard, so it's unlikely that anything else is going to make traction. In Europe, there's a different reason. In Europe, three-phase power is the big reason that we actually don't even find this connector on new EVs in Europe, because this is a single-phase charging connector, the J1772 connector. And in Europe, they use a connector that's often referred to as the Menkes connector, it's a three-phase AC charging connector, and this Tesla NACS connector does not support three-phase AC charging. It's worth noting that uh, really no EV sold in North America supports three-phase charging either. I will let you guys go down the Google rabbit hole on what is single-phase charging versus three-phase charging. But in a nutshell, here's what's going on. In North America, most homes, most residences, especially single family homes where people are doing most of their charging, have single phase power delivery only. Three phase is not an option. And from that single phase power delivery, we get 120 volts or 240 volts. And these guys can charge either 110 or 220. In Europe, however, three phase is much more normal delivered to the residents. So most folks out there that are charging their EV at home are charging on three-phase power. And it's not simply a matter of, in Europe, you could plug your EV into three-phase power and only use one of the phases, because there are rules around this. So in Europe, because they want the phases to be balanced for power delivery reasons, again, I will let you go down the Google rabbit hole yourself, but the phases should be more or less balanced. They will only allow you to draw 3.7 kilowatts on a single phase in most countries. And that would mean if you use this Tesla charging connector, you'd be limited to a very slow AC charge. But by simply adding one extra conductor, so 50% more wiring, you could get three times the power out of it. So that's really the benefit of three phase electricity. Just one extra wire three times the power delivery, but every EV in Europe that is charging faster than 3.7 kilowatts is either doing it on a DC connector or they're three-phase charging. There are very, very few exceptions. The reality of three-phase power in Europe is the reason that Tesla does not use this connector there and the reason that they're unlikely to change in the future. The timing of the transition is interesting. So far, every manufacturer that signed up has said that they're going with adapters in 2024 and then in 2025, this plug will be natively on your vehicle. And interestingly, most companies have said there isn't going to be some sort of dual side-by-side -side thing going on. They're just going to go with one plug on the car, NACS. This seems to be coordinated with the rollout of the V4 supercharger stations with Tesla and their next generation connector. The connector is compatible, of course, with this connector, but it's going to support up to 1000 volt DC charging and high current applications as well. And that makes sense because companies that have said, yes, we're signing up for this, currently support higher voltage charging than Tesla does. 
Currently, Tesla V3 stations go up to about 480, 500 volts or so. And if you wanted to charge your Hummer EV at its fastest speed, you'd need to go up to 800 volts in order to do that based on the design of the vehicle. So that's probably why some of these manufacturers are delaying just a little bit. And that brings me along to perhaps the unpopular opinion in this video, which is I honestly hope that Tesla just retains control of the standard or at least as much control as they possibly can. It is going off to SAE and SAE is going to be doing their thing with the standard and trying to make a standard around it. But to be perfectly honest, this probably is the way that it is and isn't like this because one company designed it for their specific application and their vehicle. And that's why this is the way that it is. And if you want it to still be a slim, sexy connector, if you want it to still be what it is now in the next generation, then most likely one company has got to be in control over it. It can't be this design by committee thing. I know that's kind of unpopular, um, but you know, that's my thought at the moment. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section. And always, as always, hit that subscribe button, find us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, et cetera. And I'll see all of you next week with uh, perhaps a less controversial opinion. See you later.